Hey folks, this is Captain Jones here to give you an introduction to the LC3 instructions. We're finally going to start learning um, what sorts of things our computer is capable of. Our objectives today are, number one, to describe the format and the operation of five instructions. You can see them here. Um, we'll talk about each one in, in detail. Um, then we're going to describe the hardware and control signals that are required to be able to implement those instructions using the data path that we just learned about. Um, and then lastly, we're going to discuss the three different categories of the LC3 instructions, operating instructions, data movement, and control instructions. All right, and then, oh, and then lastly, we're gonna talk about the instruction cycle. So let's get started. Okay, so these are our five instructions, add, which you probably already know is gonna be adding two numbers, and, like a logical and, LD, which is short for load, BR, which is short for branch, and uh, something called trap 25, which is, um, which we'll call, might also call by the halt instruction. Um, so uh, from the last lesson, you might recall looking at the data path, we started to get kind of a, a glimpse of what some of these instructions might look like. We need a way to differentiate between these instructions. So one thing that we kind of didn't mention uh, is that each one's going to have to have an opcode, um, an operation code that uniquely identifies each of these instructions. Now in the LC3, the opcode just happens to be four bits long. Um, so uh, all of our instructions are going to be 16 bits wide. The, the four most significant bits you can see here on the left are reserved for our opcode. Um, and so that means we can have a maximum really of 16 different instructions in our computer. All right, so let's take a look at the first one, add. The opcode for adding is 0001, and it comes in two flavors. Number one um, is uh, is taking the, res the, the values in two registers. SR1 stands for source register one, SR2 stands for source register two, and, uh, and placing the result of that addition in DR, the destination register. So you can see here, um, I've got my opcode for the add instruction all the way on the left, 0001. And then what follows in bits, uh, bit positions 11 through nine is my destination register, um, followed by my source register one, a couple of zeros, and then source register two. Now this one right here, bit position five, this is kind of an important one. The fact that it's zero is, um, is indicating that the add instruction is of this format where I'm taking two different registers and, and adding them together. If bit position five is a one, then my add instruction takes on a slightly different flavor. Um, I'm still sort of, um, I still, I'm, I'm adding something to a source register and placing that result in a destination register. But instead of my second operand coming out of a register, um, I, I have the ability with this LC3 instruction to specify um, a five bit, what's called an immediate value. So this, um, this value would get sign extended. That's what SCXT stands for. Sign extended, then added to whatever value is in source register one, and then placed in the destination register. Um, so I think I got an example of this. I don't know, this is of the register one. Um, so you can see here, if I've got um, my add opcode 0001, if I'm specifying destination register two, my source register one is three, bit position five is a zero, meaning I interpret this last little bit as, a, as another source register, that's number four. But when I pack all that together, this is what it looks like in, in hexadecimal. So, so hex one, four, C four, right? This is a, a number you might see in the LC3 memory that has a specific meaning as an instruction. What effectively that means is that I'm taking the values in R3 and R4, adding them together and placing them in R2. And uh, so you can see at the bottom here, you know, if, if R3 and R4 have the values 5 and 17, then um, once this instruction executes, I would expect to see the value 22 in register number 2. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the thing about uh, this, this value here, which um, I forgot I didn't have an example for, is just to keep in mind that this is a signed integer value, right? So, um, you know, effectively bit position 4 here is, is sort of like my, um, uh, my signed bit. The, uh, the range of values for, for this number is, um, can be as positive as zero, zero, or sorry, zero, one, one, one. That's the most positive number I can have in there, which of course is positive 15. Um, and the most negative number I can have is one, zero, 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 which is negative 16. So, um, so that's the range of, of, of literal values I can, I can sort of add uh, to a register. Um, if I wanna add, larger numbers, I gotta get a little creative. Okay, here's what this looks like kind of on the hardware. So you can see here two diagrams. One is uh, on the left taken directly from the textbook to try to you know, kind of cut away the, the unnecessary stuff and show you how 
this instruction here, add R1, R4, um, and negative two. So, so subtract two from R4 and place the result in R1. How, how this would sort of flow through the, the LC3. The, num the negative two uh, gets sign extended. Um, bit position five tells the this multiplexer here that we looked at last time, hey, don't take the, the second uh, the second operand from the register file. Take it from this, this sign extended portion. Perform the adding on, on this value and then send it back into R1. One thing to note is that this is one of the instructions that also sets our condition codes. So, so as a byproduct of completing this addition, the negative zero and positive flags are set based on the result. So on the right hand side here, I've got the exact same thing to sort of rearrange so it looks, you know, so you can see kind of the routing on top of the actual data path um, that we looked at last time, because this diagram here will get you know, quite familiar to us. So you can see here, coming out of my instruction register is that sign extended value negative two. Um, bit position five is a one, so this SR2 MUX is choosing the negative two value. R4 is coming out of my register file. Those are being added and sent back to R1. And my logic, um, oh, sorry, my, my condition codes are being set. I also tried to kind of annotate on here what some of the um, control signals are. So you notice here, gate ALU has got to be a one to turn on that tri-state buffer to allow the ALU to put data onto the processor bus. Load reg has also got to be one to enable it to tell the register file to take the value off of the processor bus and store it in R1. Okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna go through uh, these five instructions today, but I wanna bring to your attention, or just sort of remind you that Appendix A is kind of the definitive guide on the, um, the instructions that go for the LC3. So if at any point, the text or, or the video here doesn't quite make sense. Definitely, you know, refer there before you sort of throw your hands up and say, "Does I, I don't get it." Um, you can see here from the add instruction that, in, in a bit of a condensed format, uh, is, is everything that that we just talked about so far. Okay, let's talk about the AND instruction. The opcode for this is zero one zero one. Just like the add instruction, this comes in two flavors. So if bit position five is a zero, then what I'm going to do is, or what I'm telling the LC three is to take. Um, treat the values in uh, bits eight through six as my first source register and in bits two through zero as my second source register. Take the two values that are in those registers and them together and then store the result in my destination register. And you could probably already guess if, if uh, bit position five is a one, then uh, instead of the, these lower bits being treated like a, like a register number, we're gonna treat them like an immediate value and we're gonna perform an anding of uh, whatever values in the first source register with um, this sign extended value. Okay, so here's an example of what that might look like. Um, if I've got my, my opcode here for AND, the AND instruction 0101, I've got um, destination register 110, so register six, which is gonna get the result of 000, register zero, being ANDed with an immediate value, 11100, which is a sign extended value. Um, you can see here, what you know, when it's smushed all together, the hex, you know, the thing I might see in my LC3 memory is 5C2C, which is, you know, sort of meaningless until you unpack it and to see the bits. And, and what that means in kind of layman's terms, I'm going to take the value in R0. I'm going to and it with this value. Notice all, all these ones here. It's because I've, I've taken this, this most significant part of my immediate and sign extended it, sort of propagated it all the way to the left. And uh, you can see here, if R0 had the value 0003, then R6 would be zero after this instruction executes because the three would just, is just a one in these last two positions. And when we end it with this, we'd get zeros. Okay, let's look at the load instruction. Load has the opcode 0010. And uh, what I'm gonna do with the load instruction is effectively I'm getting a value out of memory. And, and here's how it's computed. So you can see here, um, I've got, number one, I've got still got a destination register, all right? So I'm taking a value out of memory, I'm putting it in a register whose number is specified with, with bits 11 to nine. And the way I figure out where in memory I'm getting that value is based on um, bits eight through zero. This is, a, this is a, what's called a PC offset. So what I'm doing is I'm taking my, the current value of my program counter, I'm going to add to it the sign extended value that comes at the end of this instruction and then that becomes the address that I look for something in memory. Okay, so here's an example. If I've got my opcode 0010, I'm gonna load um, register one with um, the contents in memory that are located at the PC plus this value, which is three. So here's, here's kind of an example. Um, this, this is what that instruction basically is saying. Add three to the program counter, 
get the contents in memory that are at that location and store them in R1. So uh, if the program counter happens to be the uh, hex 3017, and if the contents of memory location 301A happen to be five, well, 3017 plus three should be 301A, unless I'm doing my math wrong. And so then the, the LC3 is gonna get the value five out of that memory location and put it into register one. All right, here's what this looks like um, in, on, on our data path. So you can see here, I'm getting my instruction, I'm sign extending some value, adding it to the program counter, and I'm sending that to the memory address register. So that's sort of step one here. Um, you can see this data path here, the instruction register is sending a value that's getting added to the program counter, and, and, and that value is going, getting put on the processor bus, and it's being loaded into memory register one. And this should, this should be a one right here, too, because I'm, I'm loading this register. Um, I'll note that um, in future diagrams, this is actually corrected. It was slightly wrong in, our, in, our, um, in the previous diagram. The, the value that gets, goes to this multiplexer is coming directly from the, from the program counter, not necessarily from, from this path here. So that's a little correction that's, that's made uh, later on in the book. Um, and you can see also, of course, gate, M, gate more mux has got to be a one in order to allow that to get to put something on the processor bus. So then that, that's step one. Memory address register gets loaded with this value, uh, PC plus the offset. On number two, um, memory is interrogated. It's allowed to sort of read from this address and then that gets sent to the data register. Load MDR has got to be a one, so that register is loaded. That's sort of like this number two here. And then lastly, uh, number three, the contents of the MDR are allowed to be put on the bus, so gate MDR is one. Those contents go all the way around to my register file. Uh, at least in this instruction, I'm, I'm loading R2 with that value, so, so destination register is R2. Load reg has got to be a one in order to, to allow that um, value to be stored in the register file. And then just like my operate instructions, add and 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 not, um, the load instructions also all set my condition code. So a byproduct of loading register two with this value is that, excuse me, my condition codes are also set. Okay, let's look at the branch instruction. The op code for this is zero, 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 zero. Um, and uh, this instruction has um, two fields. I got uh, bits 11th and nine that sort of specify what condition that I want to have checked. And, uh, and this instruction says, if the condition matches, basically, then um, I update my program counter. Instead of being whatever value it was, the incremented value, um, it gets a new value. It gets its current value plus the sign extended um, uh, PC offset here, specified as bits eight to zero, just like my load instruction. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do that next. Okay, so here's an example. I've got my opcode zero, 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 zero. Um, if my condition is 101, one, this means um, basically if either the, the negative value or the positive, or the negative flag or the positive flag is set, then, then this condition matches. Um, and uh, here I got a PC offset, which is equal to uh, negative one. And so what this means is uh, if, if the last instruction that set the condition codes, effectively if the AOU result, well, at least in one case, if the AOU result is not zero, um, then the program counter gets this updated value. Program counter minus, or sorry, this is mi not minus one, this is minus two. Um, and so if the program counter is equal to 3017 and the last, the AOU result or the last thing to set the, con the condition codes was a non-zero value, then the program counter doesn't get incremented. We don't fetch the instruction at 3017. Instead, we reset the program counter to 3015 um, and get the new instruction there. Okay, um, and the reason kind of like 101 is sort of like this, you know, I'm checking for, for non-zero values is because, um, you know, you, you, if, if either the negative or the positive flag is set, um, and, and if the zero flag is, is zero, um, then what I'm saying is not, you know, I'm looking for every value that's not, not zero here. And, and if I were to invert these signals here, so zero, zero, one, zero means I'm looking for a result that is equal to zero, zero, one, zero. Um, I would encourage you to kind of go through the rest of this table and uh, fill in these, these spaces here. So convince yourself of, you know, what are we checking for when uh, my condition code is 011. Uh, we'll, we'll use lots of these uh, in this class. Okay, here's an example of, um, or a depiction of kind of how the branch instruction is flowing through our data path. So you can see here, I got NZP. Those are being sent to the, um, the actual NZP register. I'm checking if um, any of these match. And, um, and if they do, uh, or sorry, if the ones match, 
then I'm executing my branch. I'm gonna take the offset, I'm gonna sign extend it and add it to the program counter and update the program counter with that value. So now I'm right here, you see my condition codes being sent to the state machine, which is checking these values. If they match, then uh, the instruction register sends uh, this op PC offset to be sign extended, added to uh, the current value of the program counter, and then that gets sent back to the program counter. And so load PC has to be a one in this case in order for that value to be updated. Okay, let's look at the trap instruction. The output for this is one, 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 one. And uh, this is one we're gonna look at just kind of briefly now and much more in depth in unit three. Um, what, uh, what the trap instruction says is basically run the program who's kind of basically whose starting address is specified by, by this value here, the, the vector. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, bit seven to zero specify kind of the number of the starting, the program that we want to have run. There are a couple of um, effectively uh, what are called sort of like trap routines um, available to us on the LC3. We happen to be familiar with one. If we specify 25, hex 25 as, as this vector here, that's effectively our halt program, our halt instruction. So trap 25 runs the halt program, which pauses the, the LC3. And there are a couple others we'll look at in a future lesson. Um, so you can see the example here. Um, if I see, uh, you know, F025, this is, this is the um, hexadecimal equivalent of trap 25, and that means effectively halt the processor. Um, in the book, I think it's kind of cool. It talks about, okay, how, how might we actually go about halting the processor in real life? Uh, and uh, the key comes about from the fact that the, the whole processor is run by a clock. Once the clock stops, <laughs> nothing, nothing happens inside the processor. You know, everything's powered. It's still kind of waiting, but nothing's actually happening. And so if we have some means of generating this clock signal, all we need to do is sort of and it with, um, you know, the result of some sort of latch and, um, and so then halting the processor might mean just sort of asserting the reset value uh, to this latch, which would put a zero here and would effectively put a, a, a you know, flat zero on the other side of this and get it and completely stop the clock until that latch were to be set again. Okay, so um, here's kind of a summary of the uh, LC3 instructions we've talked about so far, right? We've got add with two flavors and with two flavors, load, branch and trap. And I'll, I'll make, uh, I wanna make two notes on this slide here. Number one, um, don't forget that uh, this instruction, this instruction, and this instruction are the ones that are setting those condition codes. Branch and trap don't. There are a handful of instructions that set the condition codes and a whole bunch that don't. And that's important to kind of keep in mind. Number two, I wanna bring your attention to the fact that when we sort of stack these instructions on top of each other like this, hopefully you see that there are, um, you know, they're not identical, of course, but they're very uniform, right? And basically, in this set, if I've got any instruction that's writing something to a register, the value of that register is always specified in bits 11 to 9. Um, you know, if I've got an instruction that needs to reference a, a register, um, you know, at a minimum, that's, that's, I'm going to have one register in, in bits 8 to 6. I might have my second register specified in, in 2 to 1. Um, the load and the branch instruction both, you know, are specifying some kind of PC offset and both use bits eight to zero to do that. So, um, you know, this is, um, this is a very intentional feature by the designers of the LC3 computer. And, um, and, and, and really the, what, what it, the huge benefit it gives us is that in, in actually designing this computer now, we can, we, can, um, we can design it in a much more simple fashion um, by... by um, due to the fact that the, these instructions are very uniform. Um, you know, you can imagine on, let's see if I can jump back to, um, okay, here, so like, you know, if I'm looking at my data register here, right, um, based on these instructions, uh, I can very simply wire up that, that destination register to come directly from bits 11 to nine, because at least for these five, there's nowhere else it's gonna come from. If that destination register you know, operator that field was sort of to bounce around inside each instruction, you know, to, to, to differ between the and or the add or the load, then I'd have a much harder time, um, you know, making sure the correct value for the destination register went to the register file. Okay, um, we talked about it before, but I want to hit it up again. Uh, the idea that there are different categories of instructions, recall that 
Um, our operator instructions are also called our arithmetic and logic instructions. These are the things that are actually performing some type of like math operation on our data. We've got data movement instructions that are just taking um, pieces of data and moving it around our computer. And we have the control instructions that are um, affecting the, the sort of flow of control within our LC3. So we've got our five instructions that we looked at today that fall into these categories. I've got my AND and my ADD instructions that are actually performing some type of arithmetic operation. My load instruction is an example of moving data from memory to my register file. And I've got two control instructions, branch and trap, that sort of change uh, whether the next instruction is you know, being executed sequentially or not. Um, and, uh, and so this can be helpful to kind of think of these, these instructions in, in these three categories. Okay, let's talk about the instruction cycle for the LC3. So from EE360, you might recall that the, the instruction cycle, we might call it the von Neumann instruction cycle, was to fetch an instruction, decode what that instruction means, and then execute that instruction. And in some cases, that involved accessing memory and also writing back to memory. Our textbook uses a slightly different instruction cycle, um, which is to fetch an instruction, decode it. So far, so good. Then it needs to evaluate the address, fetch the operands, execute the instruction, and then store the result. Now, um, these two are these two instruction cycles uh, are, are are much more similar than than it may seem at first first glance. In fact, we might even sort of approximate, you know, all instruction cycles to be just sort of Grab the instruction, execute it, with you know, with greater and greater granularity based on you know, on um, um, you know how specific you want to get. Um, for now, just just know that these these two instruction cycles are effectively the same. We'll use the one in we'll use this one when we talk about the instruction cycle in this class because that's the one in the textbook. And in a future lesson, if you're curious, we might get into um, kind of wh why it is that these two are, are slightly different. Um, okay, so. Um, the, uh, the instruction cycle, uh, we've, we've seen kind of the instructions, uh, we've been introduced to, introduced to a couple of instructions, we've seen how, how, how they're executed, how they move through the LC3. Um, now, reviewing the instruction cycle, it's kind of important, I think, to, um, to, to reiterate that before, oh, <laughs> let me back up, before any of this happens, you know, for computing the branch, before any of this happens with loading a value out of memory. Of course, the first thing I need to do is I need to fetch that instruction out of memory. And on the LC3, this occurs in three cycles, okay? Number one, the memory address register gets the value of the program counter. So I'm, I'm telling memory, you know, give me the, the next instruction basically. And then in that same clock cycle, you can see it here um, I'm going to increment the program counter by one. So the program counter is all ready to, to fetch the next instruction out of memory once this one's done, as long as I'm not taking any branches. Um, and then kind of like you, uh, you, you, in, 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 like we were doing for the load instruction, once I put a value in the memory address register, the next thing I have to do is allow memory to take that value loaded into the data register. So the instruction comes out of memory, it gets loaded into the memory data register. And then I have to allow that data register to, to, put it, to put that instruction somewhere. In this case, it goes into the instruction register in my control unit. Um, let's see, am I, do I go? Yeah, okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do real quick is, uh, I wanna demonstrate this. So the screen's gonna look a little weird for just a sec, because I want to go to my simulator here. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the LC3, right, on the left. I've got some instructions on the right that I'm going to execute, but we don't need to worry about those. Really what I want you to pay attention to are when I hit the clock cycle these first three times, you're going to see these first three steps in the fetch the fetch phase. So when I hit this clock cycle button once, I should see the memory address register get the, the program counter, and I should see the program counter get incremented. So let's collect, click this once. You can see that program counter got incremented really quick right here. And the value that was in there before it got incremented is now in the memory address register. Um, and we can verify that memory address register has the value 3000. That was the initial value of my program counter. And at the end of this clock cycle, it has the incremented value. Okay, next I should see the memory data register get the value out of memory that's at that address. So I'm going to click the clock cycle once. You'll notice down here, memory address register kind of flowed through the memory and put something in the data register. Um, so memory address register 300. You can see here in memory, 
the value at 3000 is 2207. So the memory data register now has that value 2207, which happens to be some instruction. And then the last step of the fetch phase is to load the instruction register with the value that's in that memory data register. So I'm going to click this one more time. You'll see the data register puts the value in the instruction register. And whereas right here, the instruction register has that same value, 2207. And this is, you know, if you can see down here, it's an actual LC3 instruction. So those three clock cycles sort of occur at the start of every instruction. Um, and then what follows after that um, is that the instruction has to be decoded. We're going to take a look here at the opcode of that instruction. And then based on the value of that opcode, we can go one of you know, any number of ways, right? There's an example of, you know, if it's an add, if it's a load, if it's a branch, you know, we execute different, um, different sequences to, to be able to, to effectively, you know, perform the add or perform the load. Well, in this case, you can see we're performing the branch and there's a part of here where we're testing the condition and either, you know, not taking the branch, going back here to state one, or we are taking this branch and we're setting the PC, the program counter to a new address. Okay, so in summary, today we looked at five instructions in the LC3 computer, add and load, branch and trap. Here's an example of one and effectively what, you know, what these look like, um, you know, when they're actually executed. Um, we, we talked about the instruction cycle and we showed how the instruction cycle and the, and the instructions sort of are carried out in the data path. How the, the first three steps of this, of the, uh, sorry, the first three steps of this little flow chart our, our fetch phase, those happen at the start of every instruction. Um, after we decode the instruction, then we can sort of perform the, the, the last four steps of this instruction cycle uh, based on uh, what, which instruction we fetched. All right, today's quote is brought to you by Marcus Aurelius, who said, I was taught to want little, to endure hardship, and to do things myself. I'll see you next time.